turn yourself in. That was the desperate plea from Harold McDonald. A hit-and-run driver had killed his six-year-old daughter. So did Harold want the killer to come clean in order to punish him? No way. Harold wanted to forgive him. On January 16, 1996, Harold McDonald was running errands when he received a phone call no parent wants to get. My pastor had told me to rush to the hospital because Shani had been in an accident. By the time Harold arrived at the hospital, his six-year-old daughter, Shantea, whom he affectionately called Shawnee, had died. I couldn't believe it. It's like something punched me in the gut and took the life out of me because that's all I, I had. Harold, who had sole custody of his daughter, learned she had dropped a picture she had drawn for him in the street. When she went back to pick it up, a car hit her, leaving her with fatal injuries. In his pain and grief, Harold turned his focus toward the driver, who never stopped. I wanted to be pleasing to God. And whatever I can do to be that example, I was willing to do it, even if it hurts. I was willing to forgive. By now, the heartbreaking story of Shawnee's death had hit the local news. What touched the community even more was Harold's response when reporters asked if he had a message for the person responsible for taking his daughter's life. I pleaded with him to turn himself in. And I said, I love you and God loves you. The next day, Mandrell Sweeney turned himself in to the police. Harold didn't press charges. The young man was charged with the misdemeanor for leaving the scene of an accident and released on bond. The following day, Harold visited Mandrell at his home. And here this young guy, 18 years old, and said, Harold, I am so sorry. I didn't see, I didn't see your baby. I didn't see her. I, 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 I was going too fast. And uh, would you please forgive me as I extended forgiveness to Mandrell. Mandrell began to just cry, and he came and he hugged me, and I had the opportunity to, to pray with him. Forgiveness wasn't for Mandrell, it was for me. And it started the process of healing instantly. More than 500 people gathered at Shawnee's funeral. I was an example to our community on how to forgive, how to give grace, how to love, how to just let it go. A year later, Harold fulfilled his dream and opened his barbershop. As he emerged as a strong pillar in the community, he was still grieving the death of his daughter. I would wake up where I would dream that she was here with me. And the prayers I would pray is just, God, help me. Lord, help me. By then, Harold's story and gesture of forgiveness had faded from the public eye. Yet some still remembered. One was Delonica, who recalls talking to Harold in his shop about his daughter. That man who was on television, his personality, his, his ability to forgive, I, I felt like he was just unreal as a, as a person. That started a friendship that led to their marriage three years later. During that time, Delonica saw on a deeper level the grief her husband was going through. He still hurt. Did he forgive? He, he had nothing but good to say about Mandrell. There was no denial that Harold loved this man with a godlike love. Harold believes that forgiveness, along with Delonica's prayers and support, brought healing and an end to the nightmares. The type of life uh, that I would be living if I would not have forgiven Mandrell would have been a life of pain, life of revenge, and life of anger. And I would not have met my wife. But because of it, I'm able to live in the fullness of life. 
On January 16, 2021, as they've done for years, the family released balloons to remember Shawnee's life. One balloon for each year. Releasing the balloons is significant of releasing love and peace and joy and happiness. And this is what I believe that Shani was on this earth for. Ever since, Harold found his own healing from grief. He gives people in his barber's chair more than a haircut. He offers counsel to those struggling with forgiveness. The couple also have a weekly radio show where they minister to married couples. They also co-authored a book on Harold's journey of forgiveness that led to his total healing. Let God heal your heart and it doesn't matter if it's seven times 77, give it back to God and say, I choose to forgive and trust God to heal you. God can heal you and he can set you free from all the struggle, all the pain, all the heartache. You gotta trust that God got it. You know, the Bible says when you stand praying, if you have only against any, forgive, that your heavenly Father might forgive you. You know, if you want to block your prayers, then hold on to hatred. But if you want to be in a state of being born again, of being able to have miracles, that's the key. And Harold found it. It was a tough one, too. It was tough to forgive. But what a, an example. But here again, if, if you have ought against any, when you stand praying, forgive. If you hold a grudge in your heart, God himself will not answer your prayers because you are cutting off the source of God's blessing for you. So I, can you imagine a, hit, a speeding driver kills your little girl? And you should hate him. You should want to have revenge and all that. And Harold says, no, I love him. I love him because I have the love of God. Now, we have something for you called forgiveness, God's power in your life. You can uh, download your free copy if you call uh, CBN. Let's see, CBN.com. Uh, you can call or visit, uh, download a free copy of Forgiveness, God's Plan for Your Life. It is so liberating. You can set yourself up and just set yourself free. But again, when you stand praying, if you have ought against any, forgive. If you want to get your prayers answered, don't hold a grudge in your heart against anybody. However long ago it happened, whoever it is, whatever it is, forgive, because that is the key to God's blessing in your life. A few years ago, Annie F. Downs recorded an interview with an author she loved. Afterwards, a friend asked her if she'd ever thought about doing a podcast. The first words out of Annie's mouth were, that sounds fun. And 40 million downloads later, that sounds fun is still going strong. Annie F. Downs is a best-selling author, speaker, and host of a lively podcast about fun becoming a priority in life. We undervalue and downplay the power of fun the place fun ought to have in our lives. We don't prioritize the fun things. Annie's out to change all that with her latest book, That Sounds Fun. She's quite serious when she says fun is the medicine we all need now more than ever. Annie F. Downs joins us now via Skype. Annie, welcome to the 700 Club. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. We need some fun, so we're glad you're here. So yes, yes. we, you know, we just went through 2020. Some say one of the worst years in recent history. Should we even be having fun right now? Yeah, you know, Wendy, what I what I think is true, and what's true in the, my life and a lot of my friends' lives is we do prioritize the things that make us the most healthy. And so we're making time to eat during 2020. We're making time to exercise. We're making time to see people that were in our safe quarantine kind of bubble. And, and to me, when you're lining up the things in your emotional, spiritual, and physical life that make you healthy, I think having fun needs to be in that as well. You know, You've asked hundreds of people about what sounds fun to them. Yeah. Is there a common denominator of what people are saying that they think is fun? 
Oh my gosh, you're going to love this, Wendy. So at the end of every episode of the podcast, I always ask my guests, but then also in the book, that sounds fun. There's over 3,000 answers of what people said sounded fun to them. And this is wild, but it almost always goes back to, if you keep asking why, people will end up saying, well, when I was a kid, mm. when I was a kid. And it's because we're looking for that simpler memories, that simpler life. We want to go back to when things felt easier than they do now. And while we can't go back and get those exact, exact experiences, we can sure bring some of those moments into our today. Yeah. And you try to get to the deeper roots of fun. What do you about is where is your hope? Mm. And where is your joy? And and what have you lost that you need to grieve? That we because if we don't feel sadness, it's really hard to feel the fullness of joy. And so, really, my invitation when I'm talking about fun is: Can you go into your life and grieve what you've lost, and remember what you loved, and bring the best parts of it into your today? Yeah. So I know that you love travel, and that used to be a big yes. part of your job, and that was fun for you. Uh, of course, last year. None of us were flying anywhere. I miss traveling too. Um, what are you doing for fun now, Annie? Oh, that's a great question because, you know, a lot of times, especially before 2020, our fun was big and loud and maybe expensive and maybe lasted for a few days. But what I've grown to love is, is simple fun in my everyday life. So playing with my friends' kids, playing soccer with my friends' kids, uh, I love cross stitching again. My grandmother taught me to cross stitch like 30 years ago, Wendy, <laughs> and I've just picked it up again. And and what's beautiful about it is it reminds me of my grandmother. Mm. It reminds me of being with my family and I don't live in the same city as my family anymore. And I'm making something. I'm actually creating something that didn't exist. And there's something really gospel about that. There's yeah. something about taking some of these, uh, these materials and turning them into something Thing that's really fun. I don't cross stitch, but my grandmother was, uh, she painted uh, with acrylic yeah. paints. And, she, and when I was a little girl, she let me paint alongside her. And I, as an adult, sometimes I will find myself wanting to do that, uh, yes. you know, just for fun. Uh, so is it important for us to get a hobby right now? Yes. I mean, that's a beautiful story, Wendy. That's a lot of us. If we were sitting around the table, a lot of our friends listening and watching would have a similar story. And it is why we need to pick up hobbies again, because hobbies are these activities, these moments that separate you from your work life, <laughs> that kind of take you away from your phone. Because I hate to tell you, Wendy, but scrolling is not a hobby, right? Like scrolling uh -oh. on Instagram. I'm in trouble. I know. It's hard for me to hear, too. But that's not a hobby, but what can we be doing that brings community, that brings connection with God and with other people and even with ourselves? There will be some Saturdays where I will listen to podcasts or listen to an audiobook and work on a puzzle. And, and 40 minutes in, I'm realizing that I'm praying about something yeah. and I'm asking God about something because when we make space, when we let our lives get quiet and get into a hobby, a lot of times that's, that's where I meet with Jesus. In your book, you encourage falling in love, which sounds great, but you don't mean that just on a romantic level, right? No, but very welcome to do that too. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I think it is great to, to let ourselves love. A lot of times, I, I don't know where this started, Wendy, but at some point I felt this, uh, this pressure to not love things as much as I want to love them. I felt this pressure to like hold back on how big my feelings were. And, and as I've gotten healthier emotionally, spiritually, and kind of come into more being Annie, I just felt like, man, what if we all just let ourselves love what we love? I love the French horn. I love soccer. I love Nashville. Like, we can just let ourselves love and, and tell shame it doesn't have a voice in telling us whether that's cool or not. Amen. What's the one big message you want people to take away from your book, That Sounds Fun? Yeah, I think if I had one big message, my big hope is that is that people will return to what used to be fun to them, that they would make space for fun in their lives. And what you will actually find when you make space for fun is you will find connection and peace and joy and love. And all those are there and ready for you when you're pursuing fun. And I think I think the connection with God and other people really changes you. Yeah, and I think God wants us to have fun.
Yes. I mean, look at Jesus's life, Wendy. He went to parties all the time. <laughs> he was a gr Everyone invited him to their weddings and kids loved being around him. Jesus was really fun. I am very convinced that, that we're, I mean, we're all made in the image of God. And if there are people that are fun, that must be true of our God too. Amen. Amen. Well, Annie, thank you so much for writing this book because we all need a little fun in 2021. And you can learn more in Annie's brand new book, That Sounds Fun. It's available nationwide. Uh, that Sounds Fun is also the name of Annie's show. And you can listen to it on your favorite podcast provider. Annie, thank you so much. God bless you. Wendy, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A California pastor is pleading with Governor Gavin Newsom to allow churches to reopen. Jack Treber of North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara said his congregation wants to worship inside on Easter Sunday. Governor Newsom, I implore you to open up our churches by Easter Sunday, April the 4th. This is Sunday and it's early in the morning. We're freezing out here. We're cold. We've been obeying for 300 years and 66 days, one year and one day, we've shut our church down. The church has been meeting in the parking lot and the open air meetings with tents. Well, another story out of California that has some parents concerned, the state's Department of Education is set to vote on a proposed ethnic studies curriculum that would include a chant to the Aztec God of human sacrifice. One writer has claimed white Christians committed theocide against America's native tribes, killing their gods and replacing them with Christianity. In response, the new California Woke curriculum recommends the chant and appeal to the Aztec gods, according to the City Journal. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Well, Faith and Begorda, welcome to the St. Patrick's Day program. <laughs> and you're wearing your green. Yes, and you've got a nice well, combination of different greens. It's the only thing greens. I could have around the house that was green. And so, good for you. Well, you it know. works. Okay. <laughs> well, shifting from St. Patrick's Day to what's going on in our world, nearly one in five that's how many Americans have gotten at least one COVID-19 vaccination. What about children and teens? Are there shots for them? And could expanding vaccinations to the younger generation be a tipping point ending the pandemic? Our reporter, Laurie Johnson, is with us. A COVID-19 vaccine trial on children ages six months to 12 years old is just beginning, meaning most kids that age could get vaccinated as early as 2022. Trials on teenagers are well underway. They could get theirs as early as this fall. Christian psychiatrist Daniel Amen tells CBN News expanding vaccinations to children and teens could clearly help in the long run. Well, I think over time they could be very important because even though children aren't getting dramatically sick, they still can spread the virus. And the more we get on top of this, the sooner we'll get away from a pandemic that has spawned a mental health pandemic that is devastating so many people. Religious leaders went public with their shots at D.C.'s National Cathedral Tuesday to encourage the larger faith community to help end the pandemic as soon as possible. As a believer and a scientist, I can see the opportunity to use the tools of science as a chance to be part of God's plan for healing. The vaccines have in many ways for many people been an answer to prayer. They are safe and effective beyond what we had a right to expect. And yet, they will not help people by sitting on the shelf. President Trump, who is now vaccinated, recommends others follow suit. I would, I would recommend it, and I would recommend it to a lot of people that don't want to get it, and a lot of those people voted for me, frankly. But, you know, I, again, we have our freedoms, and we have to uh, live by that, and I agree with that also, but it's a great vaccine, it's a safe vaccine, and it's uh, something that works. Meanwhile, overseas, the AstraZeneca vaccine is suspended in some countries over the possibility that blood clotting is linked to the shots. All this during a surge in cases, some blame on lifting lockdowns too soon. They simply took their eye off the ball. 
I'm pleading with you for the sake of our nation's health. These should be warning signs for all of us. Laurie's joining us now with more of these developments. Laurie, what about that AstraZeneca uh, vaccine? It is, is, is not used here in the United States, is that right? That is correct, Pat. So people here in the United States don't need to worry about the AstraZeneca vaccine. It is not here in the United States. What's going on with the AstraZeneca vaccine is overseas, predominantly in Western Europe. So there are three vaccines here in the U.S., Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, not AstraZeneca. But to answer your question, there have been some concerns about possible blood clotting. So out of an, an abundance of caution, they have stopped vaccinating people with the AstraZeneca vaccine. It doesn't look really, frankly, that there is a connection, but they have to investigate it thoroughly before starting back up again. Uh, what about that one shot J&J &J thing? Is, is that uh, well available now for people? Absolutely, and it's great because it doesn't have to be frozen. It only needs to be refrigerated. And the great thing about Johnson & Johnson is it's only one shot. The other two require two shots. So what health leaders are recommending is whichever one is offered to you first, just go ahead and get it because time is of the essence. Right now, it's not like a menu where you can choose which vaccine you get. You'll just be offered one. So I was told today in, in our community that Harris Teeter, which is a grocery store, is giving the J&J &J vaccination. I wonder if you go in among the carrots and the potatoes, then you get your shot. <laughs> How does that work? That's where I get my vaccines, at the Harris Teeter. That's our local grocery store. It's the pharmacy in the grocery store. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's safe to do that. Well, now, what do faith leaders need to do to get people to take this vaccine? Well, faith leaders are really stepping up. For example, Franklin Graham mentioned today that he, not only does he think people should get the vaccine, he said that if Jesus, if vaccines were available in the time of Jesus, he would talk about them, recommend them, and use them himself, and also said his late father, Billy Graham, was a very pro-vaccine person and would take the COVID-19 vaccine if he were alive today. So a lot of faith leaders, Robert Jeffress, Beth Moore, and others are not only encouraging people to get the vaccine, but also encouraging pastors who have access to a pulpit to make these recommendations to their congregations. All right, last question. If you get the shot, the vaccination, can you then, are you free to go out and about and do what you want to do? Well, the catch right there is you need to wait. So if you get a vaccination, 20 minutes later, you can't rip off your mask and go paint the town red. You have to wait a little while for your body to build up antibodies. Uh, two weeks minimum, but most health, pro health professionals recommend waiting one month, and then you can pretty much do what you want. Although it is recommended to continue to wear a mask if you're around unvaccinated people, because it's still unclear whether you can be a carrier of the virus. And so if you're around people who especially are high risk and haven't been vaccinated, it might be a nice idea to continue to wear a mask. That's why you saw people like Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci and even President Biden who have been vaccinated longer than one month ago still wearing masks around other, pe around other people. Oh, all right. Thanks for that information. And folks, uh, we're almost at the end of this thing. Thank the Lord. Well, another war, uh, week, uh, in other news, excuse me, after six weeks, President Biden is about to break his silence and hold a press conference. How about that? John Jessup has that story. Thanks, Pat. The president's team says he'll hold his first press conference next Thursday, March 25th, after increasing media pressure. Most presidents in recent memory have held a press room Q&A within the first month. Biden also going one on one in an exclusive interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Responding to the growing crisis at the border, the president pointed the finger at the previous administration. Well, first of all, there was a surge the last two years, in, in, in 19 and 20, there was a surge as well. This I'm, one might be worse. No, well, it could be, but here's the deal. We're sending back people. Do you have to say quite clearly, don't come? Yes, I can say quite clearly, don't come, and what we're in the process of getting set up, so don't leave your town or city or community. More than 4,200 unaccompanied children remain in custody at the Border Patrol stations, with many detained longer than the 72-hour legal limit. They're often kept in tent-like structures where some reportedly are sleeping on the floor. 
House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy described the scene after a congressional visit earlier this week. When we walked those facilities and we looked in those rooms that were packed, these were children with no parents. These were children that went numbers of days. Who knows what happened to them? Who knows who didn't make it? So no, don't encourage them to come. Attempting to get a handle on the crisis, DHS deployed FEMA to the southern border over the weekend. And in Dallas, that city's convention center will be used to house up to 3,000 migrant teenagers. Well, an apparent attack on Asian Americans in a shooting spree targeting multiple massage parlors in Atlanta last night. Eight people are dead, six of them Asian, all but one of them are women. The first attack took place late Tuesday afternoon when a gunman shot five people at Young's Asian Massage Parlor some 30 miles north of Atlanta. About an hour later, investigators say an attacker walked into two other massage parlors, killing four more. It appears that all victims are female. Okay. And race? It appears that they may be Asian. This uh, started up in Cherokee County. My understanding, they shot up a spot there. They've shot up two spots here in Zone 2. So we need to make sure if we have any Asian spies, we need to be checking on them. The suspect, 21-year-old Robert Aaron Long, is in police custody. Investigators say it is, quote, extremely likely he's connected to all three shootings. So far, no known motive, but racially motivated attacks targeting Asians are on the rise nationwide since the COVID pandemic hit a year ago. A study by the group Stop AAPI Hate found nearly 3,800 anti-Asian anti hate incidents between March 19th of last year and February last month. More than 500 recorded in 2021 alone. Well, the Anti-Defamation League reports white supremacist propaganda made a surge across the United States in 2020. The report revealing 5,125 cases of hate messages, including racism and anti-Semitism, spread through flyers, posters, and banners. A former extremist says crises like the pandemic and the 2020 election controversies created opportunities to fan hatred. 2020 saw the highest spread in hate speech in at least 10 years. Pat, back to you. Well, folks, I, you know, uh, my friend Pat Boone wrote a song called Can We Get Along? You know, it's time we start loving these people. The Asian Americans are wonderful people. The Hispanics are wonderful people. And uh, the African Americans are wonderful people. And if we just get to love each other, uh, I mean, really, uh, what the world needs more is love, sweet love. I mean, we sing that song, but we really do need that. We need to love each other and, and recognize that each person is made in the image of God. 100 million Americans in 17 states face dangerous weather over the next couple of days. The Storm Prediction Center issued a, quote, high-risk alert for much of the South. Forecasters say large hail, intense rainfall, flash flooding, high wind gusts, dangerous thunderstorms, and tornadoes are all factors beginning today. The highest risks remain until Thursday, and Pat, the storms could last well into the overnight hours. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, first we're having global warming, then they freeze in Texas, the worst freeze probably in their history, and, and the water they can't drink, and it, it's just awful what's happening the weather. I mean, here it was crowding 80 degrees, and, and then it dropped down to uh, 30, 29. I mean, it's just, I mean, we. I wish the weather would make up its mind. <laughs> Today's the day for the wearing of the green in tribute to a wonderful human being who's known as St. Patrick. Well, you might think the patron saint of Ireland is celebrated throughout the whole Emerald Isle. Think again. For the people of Northern Ireland, St. Patrick is a controversial figure. Why? Dale Hurd explains. St. Patrick may be the patron saint of Ireland, but he did much of his ministry in Northern Ireland, so much so that he even asked to be buried here. But the view of who Patrick is and what he stands for is as divided today in Northern Ireland as the wall that still divides part of Belfast. While many nations celebrate St. Patrick's Day enthusiastically in Belfast, it's complicated, at least for many of the city's British Protestants who see Patrick as having been hijacked by Catholics. I think that St. Patrick means probably two different things to two different groups of people. Johnny McKee is lead uh, pastor at New Life City Church, which sits squarely on Belfast's dividing line. 
part of its building in Catholic Belfast, part of it in Protestant Belfast. The Protestants don't celebrate him because even they view him as green, as Irish, as Ireland, as Catholic. Um, and the Catholics, again, unwittingly, um, celebrate him as Catholic, even though he was neither, for me, Catholic nor Protestant. This is the Schenkel Road in Belfast, and local legend has it that St. Patrick walked this road during his ministry. But later, it would become a symbol of bloodshed and destruction during the time known as the Troubles. 30 years of fighting between Catholics who wanted to join Ireland and Protestants who wanted to stay British left 3,500 people dead. A peace agreement was finally signed in 1998, and Northern Ireland is healing, but still has a ways to go. Because all of Ireland was once a part of the United Kingdom, that red X-shaped cross in the Union Jack is actually the cross of St. Patrick. But that doesn't seem to impress the Protestant British here. We would like to think that what Patrick stood for could be a great unifier within our communities. But we've politicized him and we've made him into a religious icon. Jack McKee, senior pastor at New Life City Church, walks with the cross on some of the same roads that St. Patrick used. He walks for peace and reconciliation between the communities. He walks with former terrorists, now born-again believers who used to fight each other and today worship together. His message was one of love, was one of hope. People on both sides would, would accept that. But if he were to be here today, then you could be sure that both sides would want to drag him into their camp. And that perhaps even both sides wouldn't genuinely want to hear what he has to say. Patrick landed on the coast of Northern Ireland in County Down in the fifth century. And it's near the cathedral at Downpatrick where his remains are believed to be buried. So is Patrick buried here? He's not buried right underneath that stone, but he's on this hill. If you can imagine this, centuries ago, it was just one of the little hills of Down. He was brought here in 461 and buried on this site. Patrick, who ministered to violent tribes, would have had a heart for modern Belfast, parts of which remain plagued by hatred, drug abuse, and broken families. But how would Patrick be received if he returned to Belfast today? Pastor Jack has tried carrying the cross on St. Patrick's Day and felt the hostility. And as I'm walking past with the cross, one of them shouted out, um, you're an effing idiot. And I thought to myself, that's so ironic that on St. Patrick's Day, the idiot is the one carrying the cross. So like parts of the new peaceful Northern Ireland, Patrick still waits to be rehabilitated, to become not only meaningful to Catholics, but to Protestants as well. As far as I'm concerned, Patrick was a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ. Whether we call him evangelical, whether we call him born again, and his message to all the people, regardless of what camp that they found themselves in, regardless of what kingdom that they identified with, his message to the people was Jesus Christ as the savior for humanity. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Belfast. That's the word, Jesus Christ died for all humanity. And Patrick is not Protestant, he's not Catholic, he's just one of us, and Wendy. Amen, what a great story. Well, St. Patrick's Day is, of course, the perfect day to learn the true story of Ireland's patron saint. For your gift of any dollar amount, we'll send you a DVD copy of CBN's latest docudrama, I Am Patrick. You'll also be able to enjoy this stunning film in streaming 4K on the CBN Family app. And today, March 17th, you'll get access to a special premiere of the theatrical release. It includes the full movie, plus an exclusive pre-show segment and other content. So just visit IamPatrick.com or you can call 1-800-700-7000 or text Patrick to 71777, a very lucky number. And this is fantastic, I've watched it and I think everybody should see this. I spent many years here. Now available. And I've returned with a message. I am Patrick. Get your DVD with 4K streaming access for a gift of any dollar amount. Also included is your special access to the St. Patrick's Day premiere of the I Am Patrick theatrical release with exclusive bonus content on the CBN Family app. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit IamPatrick.com today.
Sending her children to an orphanage? That looked like the only option for a desperate single mother named Diana. Get rid of your kids, give them to an orphanage? She was already struggling after her husband deserted their family. Then Diana lost her job due to COVID-19, and she and her children were left to starve. 40-year-old Diana still remembers the day her husband left her with three small children to raise. My children were very little. I had to leave them alone at home to go to work. If I didn't work, we didn't eat. Diana did everything she could to provide for her kids. She sold food and drove a motorcycle shuttle for school children. But ever since COVID-19 hit Indonesia, schools have been closed and Diana has been out of work. It was not the first time she felt this desperate. I remember there was a point when I wanted to commit suicide because the burden was too heavy. Diana is a Christian. As she prayed, she wondered if sending her kids to an orphanage was her only option. Every time I saw them, I put that thought out of my mind. I said, God, please strengthen me. I really love my kids, and I don't want them to live in an orphanage. Operation Blessing in Indonesia has been assembling thousands of food packs with rice, eggs, oil, and other essentials to help vulnerable families like Diana's. He sent you to help us with the food pack. I really thank God and thank the people who made this happen in our life. You've never been to Indonesia, I imagine. Most of you have not been, but you know, you have, most of you haven't been there. And yet, there's a lady over in Indonesia that you've helped. Just think of that. Because the Lord's Spirit is working through you, and you become the hand of Jesus extended. You know, I was sick, and you came to see me, you visited me. I was in prison, you visited me. I was hungry and naked, and you fed me and clothed me. So you did that when you joined the 700 Club. How do you do it? Well, it's $20 a month. 65 cents a day, and you can become a member of an army of thousands that wants to change the world. 1-800-700-7000. Give us a call so you can count on me. And by the way, when you join, it's my pleasure to give you a copy of my book, I've Walked with a Living God, that seems to be uh, touching people's lives all around the world. Everybody that loves it, I've given it to several people as gifts, and I've, the com main comment is I couldn't Put it down. Yeah, I couldn't put it down because people just love it. It just—it's such a great read. It well, just—it's mm. it's beautifully honest and it's right from the heart and it's—it's it's filled with miracles and so it's all for you. Okay. Well, here's somebody, Willie May from Missouri City, Texas, has read your book, Pat. She, uh, Willie May, said, "I enjoyed reading your wonderful book. I have walked with the living God. I'm sharing it with my family, especially my three great grandchildren. Mm. My faith is stronger, and I know God loves me and my family." Thanks, well, Willie May. We appreciate that. I, I wanted to go all around the world, and that's what I'm hoping for. But anyhow, that's good. All right, we've got some. Yeah, we're going to start with some questions. Uh, uh, Alex has this question for Pat. Uh, he says, I don't necessarily anticipate the mark of the beast to be a physical stamp or a visible tattoo that people will get on their forehead or hand. I would not be surprised if it is indeed some kind of chip people get into their bodies, hence the ability to buy and sell. But I'm wondering how we will be able to recognize what the mark of the beast is and when it is here. Pat. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, if there is such a thing, uh, they do have implants now and tattoos uh, that would uh, be right under your skin that would, um, you could have all your information implanted in a little chip about all your medical conditions and so forth. And they're working on things like that right now in various laboratories. Uh, but I, I think the whole idea of your, your hand is, is what you do, your mind is your volition, and your hand and your, your uh, tattoo, the mark of the beast, 
It means you're giving yourself over to satanic things. That's really what it amounts to. It isn't necessarily some mystical thing we're talking about. We're talking about where is your mind and where are your actions and to whom do they belong? That, that's the big question, all right? All right, here's the question from Macy. She says, my husband is 100% sure he's going to go to heaven. And I ask him, what about all those women you slept with before you got married and the woman you slept with after your divorce? He said it's okay because they weren't married. Is he still going to heaven? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, if, if immorality would keep people out of heaven, there'd be a whole lot of people not going. Uh, but you know, look what happened to David. David not only uh, had an affair with a married woman, Bathsheba, but he had, uh, she got pregnant and he, he had her husband killed to cover it up. And yet God said, he's a man after my own heart who carries out all my programs. And he said, restore to me the joy of my salvation and take not your Holy Spirit from me. God will forgive. The question is, are you going to go out into eternity without asking for forgiveness? If you're keeping on the thing, he that is born of the Spirit of God, quote, does not keep on sinning. That's what the Bible says, all right? All right, good word. Cora says, my question is, how do you overcome loneliness? Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I, you've got to know your heavenly Father's with you wherever you are. Jesus is never going to leave you. And what you need is to stay uh, tuned into Jesus Christ. That's what you, you know, I mean, he's, your, he's, he's always with you. And get alone with him in the Bible and you're talking to somebody, you're never alone with you with him, all right? That's right. All right, Lee says, hi, Pat. What are the best supplements for your skin? Also, do you think it's okay to be in the sun for 20 minutes a day? I like to walk and I don't take the time to put on sunscreen. All right, I, I really think that uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a cosmetician. I, I've, I've got all kinds of stuff that I take. I've got, you, you, I have to take a, an array of vitamins that will just blow your mind. So I don't <laughs> go into all that. But I do think if you're gonna get the sun, you ought to put a sunscreen on because uh, the, the, the rays of the sun can really do damage to you. And it doesn't take too long before you start getting, uh, there's a possibility of skin cancer and so forth. But having a little sunscreen, certainly it's not going to hurt you any, and it, it, it will certainly protect you from problems later on down the road. It'd be right. so nice if the sun uh, you know, didn't age you and didn't cause skin cancer because yeah. it feels so good, especially this time of year. You're just yeah. so starving for some sunshine. Well, I tell you, up on the mountain where I, I, I go, uh, it's much closer, and you could get burned so quickly if sitting in the sun, mm -hmm. you, you don't realize what's happening oh, yeah. because the air is thinner. But uh, I think a little sunscreen, a little, a little uh, uh, of those uh, things is, is very important, all right? Yeah, I, I wear sunscreen year-round. So. Yeah, well, you do. Okay, good. <laughs> all right, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. This viewer says, I was committing habitual willful sin. I always repented and then sinned, then repented again. I'm now repent, repented and trying with God's help to change, but I am worried, is it too late for me? Have I been cut off? Uh, no, you haven't. Seven times seven is what the Lord says. You come and if you ask for forgiveness, God is always, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I'll take your sins from you. And God will forgive you. He's waiting for you to come, but look, don't come in and say, I, I'm going to confess to this, but in my heart, I'm not going to keep on doing it. You know, if you really are born again, you can't keep on sinning. You just won't do it, all right? Amen. Here's Sam. He says, hi, Pat. In Matthew 16, 19, the NIV, Jesus tells the people, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Does this verse tell us to bind the evil spirits and the devil? Do we not have the authority to rebuke or bind the devil and all evil? Uh, uh, that, that thing's got nothing to do with the devil, to tell you the truth. I mean, y yes, you have power to do that, but what he's talking about is, is regulations. Uh, you know, the church has the power in his name to bind regulations and to loose regulations. That's what he's talking about. You see, the, the law had so many requirements and he gave his church the power to bind them, to, to make them obligatory or to take them off. That's what that's about. Uh, the demon thing is, <laughs> is totally different, all right? Well, today's power minute comes from James. Do not merely listen to the word 
but do what it says. Thank you for being with us. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.